is the Lord Cornerstone. If you're glad to be in the house of the Lord, let's all stand to our feet, lift up our hands, lift up our voices, and put your name together tonight.
God on earth knows only how to triumph. Oh, my God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you,
Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that the battle belongs to the Lord? Amen. I don't know about you, but there's some battles that I just couldn't win. Right? There's some battles that, that I can't handle them on my own. I thank God that he's in my corner. I thank God that he's fighting for me. And he knows exactly what I need and exactly how I can defeat the enemy that is coming against me. Amen? Amen. Thank you, praise team, for leading us in worship. Uh, they always do an amazing job, don't they? I have a handful of announcements that I would like to chat with you about before we get into our series this evening. But um, the first thing is PDQ Fundraiser. Oh, yeah, the young people are excited about this. Uh, this is this Sunday, the 26th. All you have to do is go through PDQ after church um, or any time, I think, really, after service. And just tell them that you're with Cornerstone Ocala. And 20% of your proceeds go straight to the youth department, which is quite amazing if you really think about it. Last time we did this, they made like $600. And all they didn't have to do nothing. And we still got to eat, which is amazing. So I would encourage you to please participate in that. That is this Sunday. Um, another announcement is, where is Sister Elise? She just probably left, didn't she? I think so. Sister Elise, who was leading worship up here um, just a few minutes ago. There she is in the back. Wave your hand, Sister Elise. Yes. Everybody loves Sister Elise. Her bridal shower is this Saturday at 1 o'clock in the Church Fellowship Hall. Um, there is an invitation in the lobby uh, with more details if you would like to attend that ceremony. She will be changing her name shortly, uh, marrying Brother Levi, the guy on the keys right here. So they're, uh, they're in the process of, of growing up and, and being mature and going through all of adulthood. You know what I'm talking about. Um, and then finally, we're going to do something totally different tonight. Tonight, we're going to take up an offering. Everybody all right with that? Okay. But the offering is not like what you think it is. The offering that we would normally take, would we would get a little, uh, an usher, and he would get the little bag, and he would come around, or he would stand up front, and you would put money into the basket for an offering. The way that we're going to take an offering tonight is you are going to get out your phone. Turn to your neighbor and say, I don't know where this is going. Get out your phone. Everybody in here has got a phone. I know you got a phone. You ain't fooling nobody if you say you don't have a phone. Brother Hagel, you might not have a phone. I believe. I actually believe you. Um, everybody else, though, get your phone out. And some of you have probably already given this offering, but some of you haven't. And the offering that you're going to give tonight is you are going to go to iTunes, the iTunes store, on your Apple device. If we could put up uh, the little logo, it looks like that purple star. Now, if you don't own an Apple device, we're going to raise an offering for you to... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. If you don't own an Apple device, you're really kind of out of luck. You need to go to Spotify. Spotify is the green logo. And here's what you're going to do. I'm going to follow along with you. If you found the pinkish, purplish star, can you say amen? Amen. You're going to press that star. And when you press it, Lord only knows what's going to come up on your phone. It is actually kind of scary. So you quickly want to push the search button, which is down in the bottom right. There's a bottom right, and you press search. If you've done that, can you say amen? Amen. And then up top, it says, there's a little magnifying glass, and it says search, and you're going to type in Cornerstone Worship. Cornerstone Worship. And when you press search, 
it will come up with um, the very first one on the top left says shine. And it says a single by Cornerstone Worship. Did it work for all of you? Yes? If it did not work, type in Cornerstone Worship Shine. And maybe that will help you. Maybe mine's already pre-populated there because I've searched it a bunch of times. But if you got it, say amen. Amen. We're, we're going we're to help you out here. We're, this is just the easiest offering, probably the most difficult offering. But it's a unique one. You won't forget it. And then you're going to click on the little shine cover art that looks like that. You're going to click on it, and then on the right, it says pre-order. And it costs a dollar and 29 cents. And I think that it is well worth you investing a dollar and 29 cents, if for nothing else, to support your local church, right? Because there's been a lot of investment, a lot of people, a lot of uh, time that has gone into this single. It's going to be a great uh, song once it comes out. It comes out this Friday. So if you pre-order it and push pre-order, it's going to charge you $1.29. And then Friday when it comes out, you will have it and you'll be able to listen to it. And you'll be able to tell your friends. And you'll be able to share it and do all those great things with music. Everybody okay with that? Say amen. Amen. If you didn't go through that whole process, you can go to Spotify, do the exact same scenario and pre-save it so that when it does come, it'll just pre-populate into your routine of songs that you like to listen to. Everybody all right? Amen. Um, we are better when we work together. Amen. And for the next few moments, I want you to step out of your aisle, greet somebody, make sure that they download it. If you don't, if you don't trust them, have them show you on your phone. Tell them that you love them. You're glad to see them. You're excited they're here. God bless you.
Amen, amen, amen. If you can go ahead and make your way back to your seats tonight. And if you know this song, I want you to sing it with me. It says, I need you, you need me. We're all a part of God's family. Stand with me, agree with me. We're all a part of God's family. It is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. Amen. If you need the people in this room to survive, could you say amen? Amen. I'm so thankful that you are here tonight at Cornerstone Ocala Midweek Bible Study. Fist bump your neighbor. Say, I'm glad you're here. Amen. Amen. We're going to be reading from Psalms, the 133rd chapter and verse 1. I give honor to Pastor Sizemore, Sister Sizemore, for affording the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm thankful and excited for what God has for us. Amen. A very familiar portion of Scripture, it says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. Proverbs 27 and 17 As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Amen. If you're going to help me preach tonight, can you lift up your hands and just talk to the Lord for a second? Just welcome him into this place. In the name of Jesus, we're asking you to take your liberty tonight. God, speak through me, Lord. Let your word fall on good ground. Whatever you would have to be done tonight, let it be done. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we'll be sure to give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. Amen. If you're going to help me preach tonight, say amen. Amen. You may be seated tonight. Amen. Tonight I'm speaking to you from the subject of better together. Better together. Some things in life are just better when experienced in the company of others. Amen. There are certain activities, certain circumstances, situations that are better experienced with someone by your side. Learning, for example, is better together. When you're taking a class, you're trying to learn a new skill and trying to study something, when you have somebody to practice with and bounce ideas off with, it's better when you're together. Teachers will actually pair students together in groups and in in tiered groups because they understand, statistically speaking, that students learn better when they are together. Major life events, right, are better when we're not alone. Events like getting married, having a baby, getting a new job, right? Things that are stressful sometimes are better when you have someone there supporting you. Enjoying a meal is better experienced together, amen? That's why we eat meals traditionally together. That's why we all go out out to eat after church together, right? One time I was eating with my grandfather. He's not here tonight, so I can pick on him. And we were going to the Sea Turtle Restaurant in St. Petersburg, Florida. And it sounds like seafood, but it's not. It's British cuisine, just kind of weird, right? And he wanted to order the Yorkshire pudding. And if you know what Yorkshire pudding is, it's literally fat pudding. It's pudding made from, from beef fat. And he wanted me to try this with him. He's like, Jonathan, it'll be great. Let's do it together. I'm like, no, I ain't doing that. And I said, I'm going to get a cheeseburger, and you're going to wish you got a cheeseburger if you got that. But he got it, and he took one bite, and he said, oh, Jonathan, this is nasty. Try it. So, of course, I said, I told you you're going to regret that, but misery loves company, right? Some things are better experienced together. Exercising is better together. Working out with a partner, with a group can be motivating, right? There's something about uh, going to the gym with someone else that can push you further and celebrate each other's progress, hold each other accountable. I mean, Pastor and I have been going to the gym together for the past couple weeks, and uh, personally, I've been more motivated to go. I've enjoyed going. I uh, I push myself a little bit farther when pastor's there. I mean, church, you'll be proud to know that your pastor's in the gym pushing around big boy weight. When he loads up the barbell on each side, all the gym bros are checking and seeing what he's going to do on the bench press. Before his, If he keeps working out like he is, he's going to start looking like Josh Herring up here. And he's going to start counting down 30, 29, 28. Amen. Exercising is better together. Driving on road trips better together, right? We went on a a fusion road trip uh, two years ago, and uh, Brother Luke Torbert was my wingman in the front, and he had the only responsibility he had was to keep me awake and keep everyone else alive, and he took that very seriously. 
right? Because when you're driving on the road by yourself, it can become mundane at night. You start to just get bored and doze off. And so he started blaring music really loudly. Now, you may wonder what kind of music Luke chose to play. And uh, he chose Disney music, Disney princess music, to be exact. And, di- and Luke chose to headbang back and forth with the Disney princess music. And that's when he had long hair, if you all remember. You all remember that? That was terrible, right? Thank God for grace. Amen. I couldn't fall asleep if I wanted to because there's something about a grown man headbanging to the Little Mermaid soundtrack <laughs> that keeps you awake. Some things are better together. Traveling and adventure are better together, right? We went on that same trip. We went on whitewater rafting, and everyone's enjoying the rapids, and everybody's in our, in our boat, and all of a sudden, I see one of our own floating by in the river. Sister Tiffany was just floating by with terror in her eyes and a forced smile, and we, uh, you know, we paddled up to her, and I grabbed her and pulled her in, and sometimes in life, you fall overboard and you get wet, right, Pastor? But it's nice to have someone there to pick you up, because some things in life are better together, amen? Literally anything is better in the context of a group. Winning is better together. Losing is better together, right? Celebrating is better together. Grieving is better together. Humans are social creatures, and having social connections is important to us, amen, for our well-being and for our happiness because God made us that way. He made us so that we are better together. Turn to your neighbor and say we're better together. Here at Cornerstone Ocala, our motto is to build a life that lasts, amen? But the thing about building a life that lasts is It's not a solo project. It's not something you can do on your own. It's something that you need uh, the support of others to make happen, right? Cornerstone is growing in 2023, and that's obvious. If you've been here on a Sunday morning, you know it's packed, right? It's tight, and that's awesome. But we're not just growing in our numbers, right? We're growing in our spiritual disciplines. We're growing in our, our, our spiritual journeys, right, our spiritual maturity. We're building lives that are going to last, and we're doing that together. We're going to accomplish all of that together through the avenue of, here we go, of Cornerstone Groups. Now, I know a lot of you have seen promotional material uh, and heard a lot of announcements regarding our upcoming Cornerstone Groups, but tonight I'm here to set the record straight. I'm going to talk about what Cornerstone Groups are going to accomplish, right? Over the next two weeks, we're going to be speaking from the concept of Better Together. This series is going to focus on the ministry of small groups. One of the incredible benefits of doing small groups is that we get to do life together with the people that we love. And you'll be hard-pressed to find people that I am closer to than my Cornerstone family because that is what we are, right? Family. Amen. And one of the main functions of Cornerstone groups will be to strengthen, will be to grow, and to connect that family. So I want everyone to leave here tonight and next week with the understanding of why we're launching Cornerstone groups next month. And I want you to be able to see the value in it. And hopefully, just maybe, you'll have this inspiration to join a group. So we're going to dive into it tonight. And tonight you're going to get the Mr. Hoodoff from the classroom, the English teacher, the former English teacher, right? Because I'm going to be analyzing the subject of Cornerstone Groups through the lens of the five W's framework. Now, some of you may wonder what that is, and it's something we use often in the classroom. It's who, what, when, where, and why. You guys know, and how. Sister Angel knows how. So we're going to be breaking down the subject of cornerstone groups through the lens of the 5W framework. We're going to talk about who groups are for, what even are cornerstone groups, where groups will meet, when groups will meet, why we're even launching cornerstone groups, and ultimately how we're going to ensure the success of cornerstone groups. So tonight we're going to focus on the first four W's, who, what, when, where. Next week we're going to focus on the how and the why, all right? So who are groups for? Who are cornerstone groups for? It may shock you to learn that the target audience of Cornerstone Groups is you, the people in this room, amen, everyone that calls Cornerstone home and everyone within our circle of influence. Small groups are for you. Point to your neighbor and say they're for you. Amen. They are for this church because we are better together. They were for the early church too, though, right? While small groups are a common feature among many churches today with members gathering in groups that reflect the diversity of a larger congregation, the initial small groups were started by the early church. The early church, as described in the New Testament, consisted of small groups of believers who met regularly for worship, for fellowship, and for discipleship. These groups included Jews and Gentiles, men and women, and people from all walks of life. If you don't believe me, let me prove it to you tonight. In Acts chapter 2, a very favorite chapter for all of us apostolics, in verse 46 it says, So continually daily 
continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were saved. This passage shows that the early Christians not only met in the temple courts for worship and teaching, but they also gathered in small groups in their homes for fellowship and for sharing meals and for prayer. Right? This pattern of meeting in both large and small groups allowed them to experience the fullness of Christian community, right? both in the public sphere and within the intimacy of their homes. By following their example, we too can experience here at Cornerstone the blessings of being a part of a vibrant and dynamic community of believers, one that is founded in the Word of God right, and marked by love, service, and mutual support. Whether we gather together in large groups for corporate worship or in small groups for more intimate fellowship, we can be confident that God is with us, guiding and directing all of our steps as we seek to follow him with our whole hearts. But that's not the only reference in the early church, in the Bible, about the early church meeting in small groups. In Acts 20, 20, the apostle Paul is speaking to the elders of the church in Ephesus, and he says, how I kept back nothing from you that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Here we see Paul didn't just preach in public settings, but he also went again from house to house, sharing the gospel and teaching believers in a more intimate setting. This is another example of how the early church recognized the value of meeting in small groups and in homes to build up the body of Christ. Everyone say, small groups are biblical. In Colossians 4, 5, Paul sends greetings to a Christian named Nympha and the church that meets, guess where? In their house, right? Yet another example of the early church recognizing the importance of meeting in homes for worship, teaching, and fellowship. In Philemon 1, verse 2, Paul writes to Philemon and the church that meets where? In their house, right? The verse provides evidence that the early church believers met in private homes for worship, for teaching, and for fellowship. It also suggests that home meetings were an integral part of the life of the church and continued to the growth and development of the Christian community. Everyone say it again. Small groups are biblical. In Acts 16.40, after Paul and Silas were released from prison, they visited Lydia's house and met with the believers there. Lydia was a wealthy merchant and had invited the missionaries to her home when they first arrived in Philippi, suggesting that Lydia's home was a gathering place for the early church in Philippi. Acts 16.40 highlights the importance of hospitality in the early church and the role of individuals in opening up their homes for Christian fellowship and for worship. In Romans 16, in verse 3 and 5, it's 3 through 5, Paul greets Priscilla and Aquila, his fellow workers in Christ, as he calls them, and the church that meets where? In their house, right? In their house. The passage indicates that Priscilla and Aquila were active members of the early church and hosted a home in their meeting. They hosted a meeting in their home. Everyone say it again. Small groups are biblical. I want you to get that tonight. And that, if that wasn't enough for you, there's more scripture, I promise. If that wasn't enough for you, how about a, just a basic historical text? One such reference can be found in the writings of the early Christian historian uh, Eusebius of Caesarea who lived from 260 to 340 A.D. in his book, Ecclesiastical History. He describes Christians in their early centuries of the church that would meet in their homes for worship, prayer, and study. He writes, the faithful assembled in small groups, that's what he said, in private homes in which they discoursed about Holy Scriptures, worship God, and thereby increased their faith and love towards God. The early church recognized the value of meeting in homes, and they used these gatherings to build strong relationships, or encourage one another, and grow their faith, because they all understood that they were better together. By following the footsteps and the gathering of homes for, di for discipleship groups, we can continue this legacy here at Cornerstone of strong community and growth in Christ, amen? One that embraces being better together. Our church is growing Hey Amen, that's amazing, and we're all excited about it, but if we're being honest, on any given Sunday morning, there's chances are there's somebody in the, in the sanctuary that we don't get to greet, right? There's somebody that we don't get to shake their hand or somebody that we don't get to say hello to, right? It's just, it just happens when the larger the congregation goes, the smaller the percentage of people you're able to connect with, right? That's just the nature of the beast, but groups is going to combat this. Groups is going to provide an opportunity for you to connect with that person that's on the other side of the sanctuary. Groups is going to provide an opportunity for the people that are struggling to build meaningful and lasting relationships on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights to do that in another avenue on another day of the week. Groups is for those people. That is who groups are for. My wife and I are really looking forward to groups 
probably more than most of you, and that's all right, and I'll explain why. Let me qualify this first. I love the youth in Hyphen very much. They are, I love them more than probably anybody in this room. My wife and I very much enjoy being around them. But if we're being honest, since we have moved here, a large portion of our time and interaction has been with youth in Hyphen, right? Two, sometimes three weekends out of the month, we're doing youth and hyphen events, and I wouldn't change that for nothing. But we are excited about getting to connect with saints that are a little bit older, right, than 19 years old. We'll be, I'm going to be real with you all. It's going to be nice having an adult conversation with someone. Praise God. Groups are going to be great. I'm just kidding. I love you all. But seriously. Amen. Cornerstone groups are, in essence, going to mirror this model that we've read about in Scripture. But what even are cornerstone groups? Cornerstone groups are going to be interest-based small groups. Raise your hand if you've heard of interest-based small groups before. A few of us, that's all right. You've all heard it before because I've said it on the screen, and hopefully you've listened to the promotion. But interest-based small groups. Now, I've been a part of a church that organized small groups before that have been kind of by demographic location or even by um, age groups, right? And in my experience, and I'm not the end-all, be-all for small groups, trust me, but in my experience, none of those things lasted. They all tended to fail because, as it turns out, people like to do exactly what they like to do. Right? People like to participate in the activities that they like to participate in. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that, right? That's the way God designed us. God designed us with likes and dislikes and preferences. And we are not going to change this attribute about ourselves, but rather we're going to leverage this truth and, and use it so that we can connect with the body of Christ here at Cornerstone Ocala. Amen? That is why we're launching interest-based small groups. So that's kind of the why behind the what with interest-based small groups. And all that means is that our groups will essentially be smaller groups of people that gather together on a regular basis to participate in various activities that they like to do. Sound fun? It's going to be fun, I promise. These activities are going to uh, be a wide range based off of our interests. We have a variety of groups ranging from Bible studies to board game gatherings, to mentorship programs, to public service and volunteering, to eating at various restaurants, praise God, to prayer groups. Amen. We have a wide range of groups that we're going to offer. And the diversity of these groups that we're going to offer is a direct reflection of the diversity of this congregation, which is amazing. Amen. These groups will be environments that will foster unity, grow relationships, and ultimately facilitate discipleship. Cornerstone groups will create opportunities for the members of this church to connect with one another outside of these walls and ultimately strengthen the bond they have with one another and the bond they have with Jesus Christ. Small groups in the early church focused on building those relationships, providing mutual support, and deepening one's faith. We aim to do the same thing here at Cornerstone. Amen? If it's in the Bible, we're about it, right? Now that we've explored what Cornerstone groups are and who Cornerstone groups are for, I think it's important to note that what cornerstone groups are not and who they are not for, right? Cornerstone groups are not a replacement for our corporate services, right? Cornerstone groups are not taking the place of midweek Bible study. We're still going to meet here every Wednesday night, same place, same time. Nothing's changing with that, amen? Nothing's going to change on Sunday mornings, right? We're still going to have special prayer meetings, right? This isn't in lieu of anything, but this is rather going to supplement all of those things, Right? And in theory, if these are based or engaged around activities that you're already doing, you might not even have to add anything to your schedule, right? You can just change the venue of where you do it and do it with the people here at church. It would be awesome, right? Groups is not taking the place of Sunday mornings. Corporate worship is an essential part of our faith, and it's, going, and it's an important to come together as a larger community to praise God and to hear the Word of God. However, we all know if the congregation gets to a certain point, gets so large, corporate worship can sometimes, for being honest, feel impersonal, right? And it can be challenging sometimes for some people to build deep relationships with others in a larger setting, right? In-home small groups are going to offer more intimate setting where we can connect with one another on a personal level and support one another in our walks with God. That's what cornerstone groups are going to do. By gathering in small groups, we can supplement, not replace, our corporate worship and word experience and build stronger relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Together, corporate worship and small groups are going to provide a well-rounded approach to our spiritual growth and our spiritual development. They work together as two cohesive things, right? Now, just because we're not in this church building does not mean that Cornerstone Groups is not an extension of Cornerstone Ocala. Just because we're meeting at, I don't know, Chipotle Mexican Grill, doesn't make us any less Christians. Can I say it that way? Amen. These are still church groups. These are still Christ-oriented. 
There will be prayer at every group, right? There are going to be discussion about God, no doubt. At the very least, we're going to have wholesome conversation at these groups. Groups are not an opportunity for us to get together and gossip. They're not an opportunity for us to get together and talk about politics. They're not an opportunity uh, for us to do, you know, engage in activities that are ungodly or wouldn't be conducive to the Word of God. None of that's going to happen at groups, right, because that's not what groups are for. All right, and as I mentioned earlier, Cornerstone groups are open to the members of this church, but not just the church staff, not just the department heads, not just uh, the people that are up here on the platform, but they're open for everyone. Cornerstone groups is for everyone that sits in a pew here tonight, right? It's important to note that the vast majority of the attendees of the early church were never mentioned by name, right? We don't know if they were big-name preachers, right? We don't know if they were worship leaders or Sunday school teachers. They were just regular church folk like us. They were just normal, average Joe people. That is who Cornerstone Groups is for, right? It's not reserved for, uh, you know, the, the hierarchy, right? It's, it's reserved for each and every one of us, right? Groups are, are for your next-door neighbor that you've been inviting to church for a minute, right? Groups are for that coworker that you've been trying to get to come to church for some time now, but they haven't quite come yet. In 1 Peter 4, verses 8 through 10, Peter writes and says, And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable toward one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. In this passage, Peter emphasizes the importance of hospitality, right, and, in, and using our gifts to serve the needs of others within the context of the community of believers. And that Greek word there is interesting for hospitable um, is philozena, which means the love of strangers, right? It means welcoming of guests. So this word suggests that early Christians were not only meeting in their homes, uh, but they were opening their homes to others, including strangers and travelers, right? This practice of hospitality and welcoming guests was central to the life of the early church as they sought to build a community that was marked by love, marked by generosity, and mutual support. By meeting in small groups and in homes, the early church and early Christians were able to create a sense of intimacy and belonging that transcended social and cultural barriers, right, and allowed them to share their lives and faith with one another in a deep and meaningful way. Though that is who small groups are for. They're for the server that waits on you at the restaurant every time you go to Olive Garden, right? They're for the family member that you meet at the park, right? They're for the backslider that hasn't quite made their way back home yet. They're for individuals that don't feel comfortable here in this sanctuary. How many know that there are people that just have an aversion towards coming to church for whatever reason? I've invited countless people at my job to come to church, and they have said things like, well, you know, I'd catch on fire if I went to church with you, or I'd, I'd do this, or I'd do that. And they just don't quite feel comfortable coming to church. I had a a guy that I used to play basketball with in St. Pete, and uh, his name was, I'm not going to say his name, he might, he does have Facebook. Um, we'll just call him, we'll just call him John. John uh, was a rough dude. John was really rough. John had a criminal history. John was just the type of dude that you didn't want to mess with, all right? But for whatever reason, he and I befriended one another, and we were playing basketball, and every time I'd see him, uh, we'd, you know, have cordial uh, conversation. And I'd always invite him to church because he was a profession Christian, at least in his own way. I always invite him to church, but he never would come. I'd say, you know, John, come to church with me this week. No, we have a special service. John, come to church with me this week. No, man, I can't do it. But there came a time when we started small groups at our church, and I said, John, why don't you come to my house? John, we're, we're going we're gonna to come to my house, and we're going to talk about Jesus a little bit. We're going to eat some food. We're going to enjoy each other's company. It's going to be real chill, real laid down. And he's like, okay. And I'm like, okay, yeah, he, he's not going to show up. But I'll never forget the first meeting. Knock on the door, and there's John with a button-down shirt on. He had a Bible in his hand and food in the other hand. I didn't even know he owned a button-down shirt, right? I didn't even know that. But he was there. He was ready to talk about it, and he came regularly throughout the, season, or throughout the semester of small groups because there are some people that may not accept your invitation to come to this church, but they may accept an invitation to come to your house, right? They may not accept an invitation to come to a Bible study, but they may accept an invitation to, you know, to sit down and have coffee with you. Right? And so we want to allow small groups to minister to each and every one that we can, right? Uh, regardless of their comfortability level with this particular building, because the idea is slowly but surely, as Pastor said, little by little, here a little, there a little, we're going to build up that comfortability. We're going to build up that credibility. They're going to be people from the church, no doubt, that go to your group. They're going to see, you know what? I can hang out with these people. You know what? I can build a relationship with these people. And then they show up here on a Sunday morning. Who knew, right? It happens. It happens. It will happen with Cornerstone groups, right? That is who groups are for. Groups are not for members of other churches. 
I'm going to say that one again. Groups are not from members of churches in our county. And that's not because we're being mean. That's not the purpose of our groups, right? It is an extension of our service. Just like we don't invite them to come to our service on Sunday morning and skip out on theirs, we're not going to invite them to come to our group. And that's not because we're rude. It's not because we dislike them. It's because it's an extension of our church, right? Groups are not a place for you to invite saints of other churches in town. Groups are for this congregation and potential future members of this congregation. We're not trying to proselyte or approach anybody with our board game group, right? It's not going to happen. Amen. Now that we've learned what cornerstone groups are, who cornerstone groups are for, let's talk about where and when they're going to take place. We touched a little bit on what the Bible says about the implementation of small groups in the early church, but we're going to revisit that just briefly. According to the Bible, the church would meet in homes, temples, courts, and public spaces, private residences, and more. Acts 2 says they broke bread in their homes. Guess where the majority of our small groups are going to be? In our homes. Right? In Acts 20, Paul speaks about how he taught publicly from house to house. Guess where our teachings and our Bible studies are going to be? House to house, right? Colossians 4, Philemon 1, Acts 16 all reference the churches of groups that met in someone's house. So guess where the majority of our groups are going to meet, church? In someone's house. You guys see a pattern here? Right? Early Christians did not limit their worship and fellowship to the temple or to the synagogue, but they met in each other's homes for meals and prayer and study of the Scripture, right? That is, this practice of meeting in small groups and homes continued throughout early centuries of the church uh, and persisted in various forms even to this day. Part of the value of meeting in homes is that it creates intimate and relaxed atmosphere that can foster deeper connections and relationships among believers. In this way, small groups can be a powerful tool for building that community, creating a sense of belonging, and is essential for our spiritual and emotional well-being as members of the body of Christ. The early church also, ref, excuse me, also referenced meeting in public spaces like temple courts. Guess where some of our groups are going to be? Public spaces. We're going to have various groups that meet at restaurants in town. Amen. My group is Taco Tuesday. So I'm going to be taking a tour around Ocala of all the best Mexican restaurants. If you know of any, you let me know. I might have to switch up some of mine. Uh, but we're going to be meeting at the boat ramp. Praise God. Somebody said amen. We're going to be meeting at the skate park. We're going to be meeting at the gun range. Amen. We're going to be meeting at the park. We're going to be meeting at the volleyball courts. We have a wide range of public places to choose from based off of our interests because that's what we see in Scripture, right? When, all, when is all of this going to take place, though? The frequency of our groups are going to vary, but the majority of our groups are going to be a weekly and bi-weekly basis. Everyone say, I can do that. I can do that. When you initially sign up for groups, you're going to be made aware of what day of the week it is, right, what time it is, and what the frequency is, if it's weekly or bi-weekly, all right? We have some groups that meet, we have groups that meet virtually every day, and our group leaders were intentional about spreading out their meetings so as to accommodate as many people as possible. We don't want anybody to miss out on groups because of their work schedule. So regardless of what your work day or your off day is, there will be a group, chances are, a meeting that you can be a part of. Our group times meetings range from early morning to late evening and some even in the middle of the day, depending on what day of the week it is. We want everyone to consider joining a group because at the end of the day, we are better together. Amen? All right, now I've been talking a lot about small groups. I've been talking a lot about who they're for, um, where and when they're going to meet, but let's talk about when they're going to start. Amen. Groups are going to officially begin March 19th. Everyone say, that's soon. March 19th. And on March 5th, that's not this coming Sunday, but next Sunday, on March 5th, we are going to have a small groups fair. Now, we've never done that before. Right? But this is going to be our first small groups fair. And the best way I can think of to explain it to you, it's going to be a lot like All Nation Sunday. How many enjoy All Nation Sunday? Amen. How many enjoy the food at All Nation Sunday? Praise God. Nothing like coming to church, enjoying fellowship, and eating food. But guess what we get to do on March 5th? We get to come to church, we get to enjoy each other's fellowship, and we get to eat food. It's all going to happen here on March 5th. Uh, formerly Homecoming Sunday, it's going to be Friends and Family Sunday. So that gives you another segue to invite somebody to church. After service, we're going to have a small group fair, and we're going to talk more about this as the date approaches, but there are going to be booths set up just like All Nation Sunday. There'll be tables in there. Everyone will be given a menu with uh, a, of all the groups that we offer, and you'll, everyone will be able to make their way through and peruse through that room with all the tables, and then they're going to make their way through those doors right back there. Everyone point to those doors. 
Those doors right back there, they're going to walk around the sanctuary and end up right here where there's going to be tables set up in the altar, registering them to join small groups that day. It's really easy. All you have to do is say, I like to do that. Sign me up, and we got you. Then you're going to come up here on the platform. You're going to take a nice picture with a little pop-up sign, and then you're going to get free food. How many like free food? Praise God. If you don't want to sign up to hang out with people, sign up for the free food. Everyone that signs up gets a voucher for the food trucks. They're going to be outside waiting for everyone to finish up. It's going to be an awesome, amazing time that we're going to do. We're putting a whole lot of effort into Cornerstone Groups because we see the value in it, and we want you to partner alongside us and see that value. Amen? Amen. It's going to be an exciting time. I want to encourage each and everyone to join an in-home small group at our church. As, we see, as we've seen in the Scripture, the early church met regularly in homes for worship for teaching and for fellowship. We, see all, we read all that in the New Testament, but there's even supporting evidence in the Old Testament um, about the evidence of small groups. And I'm going to read it to you here. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, a very familiar portion of Scripture. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is how many? One Lord. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. All of these words which I have commanded to you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk about them when you sit down in your house, when you walk up by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Deuteronomy 6, 7, Scripture instructs us to talk about God's commandments and word when we sit in our house, when we walk by the way, when we lie down and when we rise up. That indicates that our faith is not meant to be confined to just Sunday mornings. It's not meant to be confined just to Wednesday nights, right? To talk about the Word is different than teaching about it. To talk about the Word is different than preaching about it, right? Are we still going to preach about the Word? Yeah. Are we still going to teach about the Word here? Yeah. But we're going to talk about it. It implies casual conversation. In our everyday lives, we are going to implement uh, elements of our Christian walk, right? And groups is going to provide us with the venue and the opportunity to apply this concept of talking about the Word of God. The beautiful thing about it, again, these are things that you're already doing, guys. These are activities that you're already participating in, right? It's not going to add anything additional to your schedule in theory, but it's just going to be an opportunity for you to spend more time with the people that are going to heaven with you, amen, to ensure that we all make it there together because, in fact, we are better together, amen. Can you stand with me tonight? pastor's vision for this church is to build a life that lasts, right? And by joining a small group, you will be supporting this vision and helping to create a strong and thriving community of believers. So I encourage you to prayerfully consider joining a small group and experiencing the rich blessings of fellowship and growth in Christ. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm thinking about joining a small group. Amen. Don't lie now. Y'all be honest with each other. Praise God. Thank you so much again for being here tonight. Next week, we're going to continue in our discussion of Better Together as we dive into the why and the how of small groups. Before we dismiss, can we just lift our hands and talk to the Lord a little bit? Jesus, we thank you for your word tonight. I ask you to allow this, this concept, this theme, this mission to resonate in our hearts. God, help everyone to leave here with understanding and the knowledge that small groups are biblical, Lord. It's laid out in your word. We're asking you, Lord God, to help us apply this knowledge here at Cornerstone via Cornerstone Groups. Let everyone leave God charged up with fresh resolve.